actually haven't heard you uh, speak before about the um, dictum that if we don't know where we're coming from, then we don't know where we're going. But that seems to be a theme that we've talked about from sarcophagi and uh, today. And I'm going to go back about 40 million years, so hopefully that's long enough. Um, so I want to talk today, um, I'm Rachel Patel, by the way, I think I met most of you guys before. I'm also one of the first year residents, um, about something that we learned um, in passing in medical school, but not very much, and I thought was really fascinating. So I wanted to bring a little bit of a historical perspective here, and that's how we've come to um, see the color vision that we do today. Um, so humans are trichromats, but actually that is um, fairly unusual in the um, animal kingdom. And chromacy refers to the number of primary colors, which combination subtraction of the three of them results in the visible spectrum that we see. And um, in a lot of animals, including wolves, cats, dogs, ones that we're familiar with, tend to be dichromats, have uh, two different types of proteins that um, create their realm of color vision. Um, there are actually a lot of sea mammals, like walruses and seals, that are monochromatic. Um, Humans and our related uh, primates, some of them including gorillas, are trichromats. And then there are birds and fish, which tend to have um, tetrachromacy and have uh, visibility into the UV spectrum of light. And so the uh, chemical basis of this is that we have these opsin proteins that we know about, um, and that the number of types of opsins that we have usually determines the type of chromacy, the degree of chromacy that we have. So these are uh, seven transmembrane domain proteins. They uh, fall under the G-protein couple receptor category. And as we know, they bind to the chromophore retinal. So when 11 cis retinal um, becomes activated by uh, light and is trans uh, becomes uh, the all cis, or the all trans retinal, starts the visual cycle. That's how we get to the uh, vision that we have. Um, and this complex of the chromophore and the opsin is located in the outer segments of the photoreceptor in this cartoon on the left hand side. And so um, we have these three different visual pigments in our cones. Um, there is one pigment that has a maximal absorption wave of around 420 nanometers corresponding to the blue that we see. And um, this, because the, this corresponds to like the shortest wavelength of light that we see, that's known as the S pigment. SWS, but I'm going to just go with S for now. Um, there are also um, another pigment that absorbs closer to the four, uh, 530 nanometer uh, wavelength corresponding to green, or and which is referred to as M for medium um, pigment. And then there's the longer ones um, the, that correspond to the red um, spectrum of light in the 560 nanometer range. And as humans, we also have a different type of opsin that is in our rods um, with the absorption wavelength uh, maximum somewhere in between, but because we don't get a lot of color vision from dim light um, conditions, that doesn't really contribute to the degree of chromacy that we have. Um, and so genetically, when we're talking about how we get these pigments, um, we know that we have um, the S pigment gene, the one corresponding to blue light that's located on chromosome 7, and then um, there are the longer, the M and L uh, wavelengths uh, pigments that are located on the X chromosome. And this is not surprising when we found this out uh, genetically several years ago, because we know that uh, red-green color blindness tends to be X-linked and found in males. Um, and while the difference between the S pigment gene um, and, or I should say the protein, and that of the M and L pigment proteins is quite different, the M and the L ones are really similar. They're about 96% similar. And there's only a difference in just a few amino acids that um, changes their spectral sensitivity. In fact, there are just three of them that can account for almost all of the uh, difference in the spectral sensitivity between the two of them. Um, and because they're located right next to each other on the X chromosome, this raises the, or this originally raised the possibility that this probably evolved as a duplication uh, mistake that then became passed down. Um, and one could see how becoming uh, trichromatic from dichromatic would maybe confer an evolutionary advantage. The classic um, postulate, postulation um, is that you could differentiate like ripe fruit from, you know, unripe fruit on a tree, but then there have been other studies that have looked at um, it maybe playing a role in uh, mate selection or in predator detection, so we don't really know. Um, however, just a simple duplication doesn't really explain everything that happened, and that's because uh, 40 million years ago, um, we had a different ways of getting to trichromacy. So um, there are Around the time that the continents were splitting, um, we had primates that 
became um, separated by the continental barriers and took different paths. So the Katerine, um, pop and I have never actually said that word out loud in front of people, so if I'm saying that wrong, I apologize, um, population that has uh, descendants including humans, chimps, gorillas, um, started off in Africa and Southern Asia. And um, this population is referred to in the literature as old world primates. And then there's the platyremes, um, which was located more in uh, South America. And their descendants included uh, squirrel monkeys, marmosets, and these um, are referred to as New World primates. And so they have um, evolved a little bit differently. In terms of Old World trichrom uh, trichromats, including humans, as we talked about, they have uh, uh, males and females are both generally trichromatic. They have one S pigment um, gene, and then they have two longer wavelengths, usually M and L, um, pigments on the X chromosome, becoming trichromatic. Whereas in the New World, it's a little bit different. Um, all the males and about a third of the females are dichromatic. The remainder of the uh, females are trichromatic. And so to get to this, they found out that they have, again, the 1S pigment, uh, short wavelength pigment. And then they have a longer wavelength pigment, just one of them, on the X chromosome. But there are three alleles that can uh, be located at this locus. There's one that codes for a protein that in its absorption wavelength spectrum is similar to the human M pigment, one that's similar to the human L pigment, and one that's kind of in between. Um, so to put this all together 40 million years ago, um, in both the old world and new world, males and females have this S pigment gene on the non-sex chromosome, kind of got that down. In the old world, um, both males and females tend, uh, will have uh, two uh, different wavelength uh, proteins on the X chromosome, they become trichromatic. In the new world, um, the males, for example, have um, one gene, and it could be any one of these three alleles, and so they're dichromatic. But the females have two copies of two alleles, and if they are different, then they become trichromatic. If they happen to be the same um, on their two X chromosomes, then they kind of got uh, genetically shafted, and they're dichromatic as well. But it turns out that just having these pigments isn't enough to interpret the signal as color. Um, so uh, color, interp um, color interpretation relies um, in part on comparing the signals from different cones um, to each other and relaying that pathway to the brain. Um, so to function optimally, a cone should just express a single pigment um, rather than lots of them. And then it should be surrounded by neighboring cones that um, express different pigments. And in fact, this is actually what happens. So a cone cell generally expresses a single pigment. Um, and there are nearby ones that um, express a different pigment. And then there are different types of ganglion cells. Um, for example, uh, midget, or what I learned this morning was also called parvocellular ganglion cells, um, that convey uh, the comparison between M and L cones and relay a blue, uh, a red-green axis. And then there are these bistratified ganglion cells that can compare um, on uh, signals from the S cones and off signals from the M and L cones, and they relay a more of a blue-yellow axis. So I'm going to get back to that in a second, but I just wanted to focus on for a moment how we get to cones expressing a single uh, pigment. And so um, there's an element of randomness in the, this development. Um, so in determining whether or not a cone is going to express an S or an M or L pigment, there is a um, transcription factor during fetal development that will turn on or off the S pigment. If the S pigment is turned on, it then suppresses the M and L expression. And then um, in terms of the new world and old world, there's a little bit of difference in how we get to M versus L pigments. Um, in the new world, um, so not in humans, X inactivation plays the large portion of that. So of course, if you only have uh, two X, if you only have one pigment gene on your X chromosome, and X inactivation turns off one of them, the cone is going to express the other one. Whereas nearby cells might have chosen the other chromosome um, to be turned off, and therefore you get this uh, mosaic. In the old world, yes, there is X inactivation, but you also um, still have two pigment genes on that cone. So it turns out that there is this locus control region nearby that will then interact with either the M or the L sites, determine which one becomes uh, the one that the cone is going to express. And this, this seems to be, although we don't know exactly, a little bit of a random process as well. So just to um, get back to X inactivation just really quickly, um, it occurs early in development, like really early, in you know, five or 10 cell stage is when it starts. And then a lot of the, uh, most, for the most part, all the daughter cells are going to express a similar chromosome that it turns off. And so one would expect that 
if that was the case, you would have these large amounts of clumping of like similar cones that have only that are expressing the M or the L uh, pigments. But that's actually not really what we see. So there um, have been studies recently that have used adaptive optics. I thought this was pretty cool um, to essentially bleach out photoreceptors of a certain wavelength absorption and then image the remaining ones. And so they can get these artificially colored sequences of individual cone expressing uh, which opsin that they have. Um, so of course, the red ones are expressing the red wavelength, et cetera. Um, and they imaged um, a couple of, a lot of men and then one female. The men had some variable degrees of clumping. Those are those first two there. Um, I didn't put all of them on here. And then this last one is a, the, as a female carrier of uh, the protein defect. So she has one of the types of um, red, green, color blindness carrier. Um, and she actually didn't have a lot of clumping. One would expect that um, X inactivation would play a larger role in her um, based on uh, how um, it determines L versus M cones. But in fact, she doesn't really have that. So there was the suggestion that in the migration of cones to form the fovea, that it kind of intermixes the cones and overcomes this uh, clumping effect that might be expected to happen by X inactivation. So to get back to how we interpret color, there are these um, different types of ganglion cells that convey the different um, that convey the red green versus the blue yellow axis. Um, and then they go through a similar but not exactly the same pathway through the brain. So the red-green efferents uh, synapse in the parvocellular layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then they go to the deeper parts of the cortex, whereas the blue-yellow um, efferents synapse in the intercalated layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus and um, end up in a more superficial um, region of the cortical layers. And so this is important because when um, if there, since there's more to developing color vision than just having a new opsin that's suddenly there, we need to understand how evolution would suddenly favor this development of trichromacy. And so uh, one idea is that this red-green axis, when it developed, wasn't didn't just um, develop a new pathway to the brain, but it actually took advantage of an existing pathway. And that's the pathway of spatial resolution. So the determination of like the borders of something that you're looking at and then how far away it is from you. And um, in doing, in, like, the spatial resolution pathway compares the input from a, a cone to that of its neighbors. And so one could see how, since it uses the same pathway, the red-green axis could have taken advantage of that. And potentially, the first person, first primate, who developed this uh, new opsin might have been able to use it and actually have trichromatic vision. Of course, we can't really prove that. So this has all been very uh, non-clinical, so I just wanted to bring up a couple of clinical applications. Um, or you know, ways that this manifests in uh, society today. So because there are um, just a few amino acid changes that can determine how the spectral sensitivity between like L and M um, gene pigments is, um, has a different wavelength of absorption, there is some natural variability in the human population. And so there are these anomalous trichromats um, in the human population, and these have uh, two different types, of course, of genes, but they, their wavelengths might overlap a little bit more, might be closer together. And so therefore, although they are technically trichromatic, they don't have the, quite the same uh, spectrum of absorption that um, someone who has the normal M and L pigments. There also are um, the possibility of, and there is evidence for this being the case, um, human females to have more than trichromatic vision, because if they have the same natural variability, and they've got essentially four genes uh, on their X chromosome, uh, or their sets of X chromosomes that could um, be expressed in the retina, that you can have more than trichromatic, such as tetrachromatic vision. And they've done um, studies where they've taken these females who are genetically proved to have the possibility of having tetrachromatic vision. Um, in one study that I was looking at, they um, imaged, uh, tw they, they tested 24 females who had that possibility, but only one of them actually was functionally tetrachromatic. So the possibility of this is potentially more than the actual applications of it. And then finally, and that this is probably the most important, is that um, there are several ways for humans to become dichromatic. Of course, the absence of one of these genes um, can determine it, um, can become uh, dichromatic. And so we have these um, terms like protein um, defect missing the L pigment and um, deutan missing the M pigment and a tritan, which is really unusual, missing the S pigment. Um, and simple crossover misalignments can result in these defects. But there, um, in fact, when we have um, a lot of men who have the uh, dutan defect, that is, they're missing the M pigment, um, they actually have this, and I'm not, I don't have the pointer, but they have this configuration all the way over on the right-hand side. And that is they have 
an intact M pigment, uh, an intact L pigment, and then a hybrid gene in between. Um, and the reason we were a little bit, uh, the, we don't know exactly why this is the case, but it certainly can um, come from this misalignment of overlapping proteins when the proteins look really similar, or I should say, when the genes look really similar, they can overlap a lot um, and cause this, this um, type of misalignment. But um, it's been shown in the vast majority of cases that only the first, even when they have three different genes like this, only the first two are expressed, and therefore they don't express the M um, pigment gene and still become dichromatic. And just to bring up uh, one remaining mystery, um, even in old world primate populations, we as humans are a little bit unusual in that we have a higher rate of uh, dichromacy in human males. 2.2 um, to 3%, 2 to 4% of human males compared to super low rates in uh, macaque monkeys, for example. And so there's been this theory that there's been some relaxation in the natural pressure to maintain trichromacy in humans, but we don't know why or if that is the case. So I will conclude just with this picture of a mantis shrimp, which in the popular uh, world has been um, gotten a lot of fame for having 12 different types of uh, pigment uh, receptors. And so people have been saying, oh, look, it must have you know, this extraordinary color vision of the coral reefs that it inhabits. But in fact, they've actually tested this thing. And uh, it has this very poor uh, wavelength uh, differentiation. It requires about 12 to 15 nanometers of difference in the types of wavelengths that it absorbs to actually discriminate between colors. So it doesn't quite have um, the color vision that we thought, whereas humans just require like two to three. So all is not just in the pigment absence. Um, that is all that I have. Any questions that I can take? Yes. <clears throat> so great presentation on a fascinating subject. Uh, I, I went to a lecture that uh, Robert Mark gave, and some of you uh, people may not remember uh, Robert, but he was a, a, a brilliant physiologist, anatomist, and retina. And he, he talked about this color issue, and uh, he, he talked about evolutionary biology that uh, as a hunter-gatherer, that if, if you lose the red-green differentiation, the single biggest problem that affected is the inability to track blood in animals. Because you can't see the blood against the green. Mm -hmm. And that, that would have been critical in regards to the ability to actually track your prey. And that, that, would, and that, that, would, that would definitely decrease your ability to survive. Well, that's just not an issue anymore. But that was interesting. He said the other one he pointed out is we like to think of these as distinct groups but because uh, our midget bipolars have such a big impact in what we interpret, that there's really quite a continuum of all of this. And so what he did is he th had a series of slides, and then he asked us, what color do you think that is? How many say it's brown? And how many think it's blue? And it was amazing how, how this, among of the majority, had to have been there, obviously, with trichromats, how different we were in regards to these different areas. And so. He, he pointed out that uh, there, there is a, an amazing diversity. And then he talked about some of these tetrachromats who've been looked at in detail, and some of them have an amazing ability to see both into the infrared and um, into the ultraviolet and have a richness of color. And so when people talk about some colors and other issues that, that we think we're talking the same thing, we may not be, and that, uh, that there's really an unusual richness and a subjectivity that we we don't know because we only see it as we perceive it, and others don't. But anyway, and this becomes an internet it's a sensation. fascinating subject. I've never. It was one of the most incredible hour and a half lectures I'd ever heard talking about all of this. And then, and then some of the animal species you mentioned. There's some that have up to seven and see way into the ultraviolet and infrared, mm -hmm. and have a color differentiation that we can't even imagine of the clarity and the importance of mm -hmm. what they can see in association with that. So. It's, a, it's a, an important subject we don't talk about very often. The thing that I didn't talk about was, um, not th I thought this was super important to the talk, there was an uh, article that I read about reindeer and how um, because they live in the climates which have a lot of UV radiation and UV light and um, reflection off the snow, they have developed the, the ability to see UV light because you can track like urine on the snow and right. uh, things that you would otherwise would miss. like. Uh, or like foliage that's underneath the snow. Um, but it's not actually because they have a different um, opsin that absorbs that, but more because their lens, unlike the human lens, uh, doesn't filter out UV light. And so if there's just so much UV light, it overwhelms the ability. Um, it like it allows, even though the wavelength isn't peaked right. to there, your nearby um, ultraviolet or your violet um, pigments can absorb it and you can use it to your advantage. 
And then let's not forget the amazing loss of color that happens uh, from the natural changes of our lenses moving to the cataractus phase. Patients generally <clears throat> are amazed when their colors are restored, but I've had occasional patients that find suddenly seeing the clarity of some of these colors like they did when they were younger actually disturbing. It's rare, but every once in a while you'll find, you'll find people who will do that and, and, you know, and, and not like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very strange. I know I've, it's hard for me to see the difference between a, a navy blue and a black anymore. I, you know, I really have to look hard to get a lot of light before I can see that. I'm not sure I would say anymore. <laughs> Dr. Bernstein? Yeah, um, thanks for taking on a very difficult um, topic and doing a very good job. Can you talk a little bit about where we are in gene therapy for, for color? For therapy? achromatopsia? Yeah. Well, no, even for red green. For red, red green, There yeah. are companies working on it. Yes, they are. I, have, I did not read about it. I, I read about achromatopsia a little bit, but not very much. So, no, I, I can't really speak to that. But if you would like to. <laughs> they have tried it in monkeys, and they've seen some positive results. And the question is, you know, do you want to do gene therapy on 3% of, you know, you have a big, it's probably the most common genetic defect in mm -hmm. the eye, and certainly that there is, and that huge population, but they're otherwise normalized. So th that actually makes me wonder, because a lot of these um, so one in 40 men, males, that makes it not uncommon, right? Yeah. What? Yeah. One in 40 yeah. males. Yeah. One, one, one possibility would be that a lot of these men actually do have a copy of the um, opsin, but they just can't express it. So if we would be able to change the locus control region that is expressing how many different types of pigment genes, that would be a way of a little bit less invasively, potentially, um, or less destructively trying to do gene therapy there, but I don't know. I want to read up on it. I, I, it, it is an active area. Yes. Very good. All right, thanks.